ends in Gyatso as a Buddhist monk. His message of compassion, altruism, and peace have made him a statesman for our troubled times. For six million of his followers, he is Holy Lord, gentle glory, eloquent, compassionate, learned defender of the faith, ocean of wisdom, His Holiness, the 14th Dalai Lama of Tibet. Tibet, under Chinese occupation since 1950, today is at once a tragedy and a triumph. A stark example of modern totalitarianism fighting to a draw against an unwilling traditional society. This material was filmed by Chinese police in the Tibetan capital Lhasa to identify Tibetan protesters some months before the Tiananmen massacre. 30 Tibetans were killed, and an estimated 10,000 troops still stand sentinel over the city's 50,000 Tibetans. The issue of Tibet has remained on the fringe of the international agenda. However, that is now changing. Its political and spiritual leader, the Dalai Lama, was awarded the Nobel Prize for Peace, 1989 to 90. I accept it on behalf of the six million Tibetan people, my brave countrymen and women inside Tibet, who have suffered and continue to suffer so much. They confront a calculated and systematic strategy aimed at the destruction of their national and cultural identities. The price reaffirms our conviction that Tibet will be liberated. While much of the world expressed revulsion at the brutality of the Chinese government against its own people at Tiananmen Square, it has remained largely ignorant of continuing human rights abuses against Tibetans, whom the Chinese consider racially different and inferior. To the Tibetans, both inside and outside of Tibet, he has remained their spiritual and temporal leader, embodying the ideal of the religion he heads and the people he represents, but no longer rules. He personifies the past as well as the future history of Tibet. The Dalai Lama is heir to a religious tradition that began in Bodhgaya, India, in 2,500 years ago. When seated under a tree, a young Indian prince from deep meditation attained decisive knowledge of the human condition and the unshakable certainty of his release <laughs> He had become the Buddha, the enlightened one. The core of the Buddhist path is the recognition that life is an endless round of suffering, disease, death, and rebirth. A cycle caused by a desire, bred of ignorance, and of an innate misconception of reality. Some beings who have attained enlightenment and thus liberation from rebirth opt for reincarnation voluntarily, out of compassion for others, in order to teach and serve humanity. They are called Bodhisattvas. The Dalai Lama, recognized as one such bodhisattva, is the reincarnation of the patron saint of Tibet, Avlokiteshvara, or the Buddha aspect of compassion. <laughs> Tibetans were confronted by natural grandeurs so cruel that they brought an intense awareness of the contrasting splendors and terrors in the universe, relieved by a few pleasant planes and a spiritual quest. 
spreading 2,000 miles from China in the east to Afghanistan in the west, with India the home of much of its culture in the south. Tibet is a severe Himalayan plateau, 15,000 feet above sea level. In Tibet, the previous Tibet, uh, generally speaking, of course, is a the happy society. No matter, and the backward society, meantime, uh, they're happy. Buddhism came to Tibet in the 7th century AD. Tibet was a remote, secret Shangri-La so deeply inspired by the Buddhist cosmic view that it pursued its religion in splendid isolation with an unusual fervor. Once Buddhism took hold, hunting and killing ceased out of respect for life. Armies disbanded and became monks. The traditional kings were replaced by spiritual masters. You see, unfortunately, you see, those monasteries and some, some monasteries, this institution become uh, actually, you see, sort of, it's a lot. Mm -hmm. So, not that square. And also, the general public's, how to say, the practice of Buddha Dharma. Of course, they, uh, they, they had great devotion of faith, but actual knowledge is very limited. One in four Tibetans was a monk or nun, and these constituted its de facto ruling class. Naturally warm-hearted with an innate sense of order and humor, the various classes have been immutably defined for centuries. Inside the cloisters flourished a rich culture and tradition. China had begun to assert its imperialist designs and claimed that the Tibetan nation was part of the Chinese motherland because the Tibetans, descended from the Mongolians, were part of the five races comprising the Chinese. when the great 13th Dalai Lama passed on to the honorable fields, a search for his successor began. Two years later, Tibet's regent journeyed to its sacred lake, seeking the vision of the one who would be the new leader. In the waters, the regent's party was shown a monastery, a house and a baby. Other omens directed the search party to the northeast, to the monastery and the house of the vision. When the party approached the house, a two-and-a-half-year-old boy recognized the disguised lamas or teachers and called them by name. He spoke in the dialect of the capital, Lhasa, over a thousand miles away. He also identified as his own the rosaries, walking stick, and hand drum of the 13th Dalai Lama. On the child's body were the marks distinguishing the Dalai Lamas, including the large ears, tiger-skin-like streaks on the legs, and the conch shell print on the palm. Bright October morning in 1939, the now four-year-old boy entered the great city of Lhasa in a brilliant procession, and tens of thousands of his people lined the yellow and white route, cheering and waving. This was indeed the Holy One himself, Tenzin Gyatso, the 14th Dalai Lama of Tibet. And generally speaking, Dalai Lama, the original Dalai Lama, now, for example, the first Dalai Lama, second, third, now these, uh, and no doubt, the reincarnation of our Lukashara, so that means uh, Buddha. I, uh, <laughs> I believe, you see, I am at uh, this person, uh, the blessed one. At my own, this is spiritual level, I'm not high, I still is practicing. <laughs> A constant theme of the Dalai Lama's teaching is that the essence of a Buddhist's life lies in a person's own efforts to purify his mind. Buddhism from its earliest forms included highly refined moral philosophy with a vast range of mind development and pioneer psychology. As it traveled the globe, it evolved into religion, advanced philosophy, mysticism, metaphysics, logic, and the triple yogas of India, the paths of reason, devotion, and action. The philosopher king, born of peasant parents, began his long, arduous training while the regent held temporary power. Surrounded by tutors and attendants, he lived in splendid but disciplined isolation. He was soon recognized as an exceptional student. As most of Lhasa watched, his holiness, the Dalai Lama, won his Doctor of Buddhist Philosophy degree with honors in public debate at the age of 24.
On New Year's Day in 1950, still only 16 years old, his education in real politics began. The new People's Republic of China announced its decision to liberate Tibet. As Chinese armies marched into a nation physically and temperamentally unprepared for war, Tenzin Gyatso assumed former temporal power of Tibet as the 14th Dalai Lama to steer the country through one of its darkest hours. On March 17, 1959, after nine years of fruitless attempts at compromise with the Chinese, as atrocities against the Tibetans grew, on a night of firing, shelling, and popular revolt in Lhasa, the Dalai Lama, guarded by Tibetan guerrillas, slowly began his long, arduous escape into India. Over the next weeks, an estimated 87,000 Tibetans were killed, 25,000 were imprisoned, and over 100,000 followed him into exile. Even during these terrible early weeks, the Dalai Lama continued to speak of compassion and nonviolent resistance. As a Buddhist, you see, uh, all this tragedy, the basic factor or the cause, cause it was is one's own is previous karma. Now the external, you see, factor is the Chinese forces. But the basic cause is one's own previous bad karma. The 1960 report of the International Commission of Jurists recognized that status as that of a fully sovereign state. China was found guilty of the gravest crime of which any nation can be accused. The intent to destroy a whole or in part a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group. As such, genocide. Although it's personally uh, that enemy, the harming on you, but forget that the, the enemy, the so-called enemy, is that person. You see, looking, looking at him or her, you see, that also a human being, just like me, want happiness. So it's with that reason that you could develop a genuine sympathy or compassion. At the end of the Cultural Revolution, the new Chinese order revealed that a mere 53 of the 6,000 monasteries of Tibet had survived. Of more than half a million monks and nuns, 1,300 survived in Tibet. These numbers may increase, however, a socialist education is today a prerequisite to entering monkhood. I think it is Buddhism much of its own love and compassion. And it's Marxism, somehow, you see, the, 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 the class struggle on the basis of hatred. On the afternoon of March 31st, 1959, the Dalai Lama entered India and exile. The Dalai Lama seeking political asylum in India initially embarrassed its government. Though India and Tibet shared a long religious and cultural history, Prime Minister Nehru was obliged to take into account the then recent delicate rapprochement between India and China. However, humanity triumphed over politics and asylum was granted. The Dalai Lama became an honored guest in the land of Buddha's birth. Though there was profound sympathy and substantial material support for the refugees, there was little political backing. Tibet's isolation had given it no experience in international diplomacy and few friends. In India, the Dalai Lama plunged into frenetic activity, serving as leader and pillar of strength to a traumatized people uprooted from their natural habitat into the heat, dust, and anonymous millions of India. The Buddhist concept that the material world is impermanent enabled the refugees to adapt to these monumental changes. They did not simply survive in India, they flourished.
The Dalai Lama found residence in Dalamsala, a day from Delhi, a residential area of less than two acres out of the graciousness of a foreign government was now the Dalai Lama's physical domain. He was shorn of the external symbols that attested to his power and authority in Tibet. It was a call to Tenzin Gyatso to build a much vaster empire, sourced on an inner kingdom. For the Dalai Lama, the cultivation of inner peace and a refined integrity are the ultimate weapons that an individual can use to make a difference in this seemingly irrational world. While the world quickly prepared to put Tibet back on the shelves of myth and legend, the Dalai Lama and his people were driven by a different perception of reality. Religion was their wellspring, and it had top priority. Preserving, and as it evolved, perpetuating Tibetan religion and culture became an essential strategy in exile and countered Chinese attempts to decimate it. The Tibetan identity would not be allowed to die. For every major monastery destroyed in Tibet, a new, if smaller one, was built in India, continuing the same lineage and practices as in Tibet. Children, the hope of any exiled people, continued to ordain as monks, and senior lamas now began to reincarnate in exile. Because I am outside Tibet, so still, you see, the pure form of Tibetan culture, or Tibetan, you see, uh, Yes, culture. Oh, still there. Mm. Now today, as it surprised me or strangely, the true Tibetan culture or Tibetan music community uh, find outside Tibet, not inside. The Dalai Lama has personally laid the foundations for his government in exile, a cabinet elected by Tibetans outside Tibet, a civil service established early in 1959 and a draft democratic constitution to be approved by the people of Tibet when they regain freedom. The 10th of March commemorates the Lhasa uprising of 1959. The Dalai Lama has worked long and hard to remind his people that tolerance and compassion even for enemies is a virtue. During his visit to the United States in 1987, the Dalai Lama unveiled a five-point peace plan before a congressional committee. This was elaborated upon in Strasbourg before the European Parliament. It includes a call to declare Tibet a zone of peace, to preserve the natural environment, and to stop the influx of Chinese into Tibet. To the dismay of some of his followers, the Dalai Lama even offered to renounce complete independence from Tibet, a struggle that the United States government actively, though covertly, supported until the 1972 Kissinger-Nixon rapprochement with China. The U.S. Congress has demonstrated some support for the Tibetan cause. Legislation signed into law by President Reagan codified 15 Fulbright scholarships for Tibetans in exile, condemned human rights violations being perpetrated in Tibet, and called upon the Chinese government to actively reciprocate the Dalai Lama's efforts to establish constructive dialogue in the future of Tibet. <laughs> President Bush established Tibetan language Voice of America broadcasts to people inside Tibet. Each day's teaching concludes with prayers for those under Chinese occupation, followed by the dedication of the merit gained for the speedy end of their suffering. In the words of the prayer, 
by their rough actions, masses of cruel ones are bringing down ruin on themselves and on others. They are drunk with demonic delusions. Forge the glorious unity of friendship among them, these objects of compassion, and with love and mercy, help them acquire the wisdom eye to see what is right and what is wrong. The Dalai Lama has called for international support to create a modern Shangri-La in Tibet, a sanctuary of peace in the heart of Asia, where humanity and nature can live in harmonious balance, a creative center for the promotion of peace. The Dalai Lama's spiritual experience affirms both faith and reason, with reason being limitless. To a mind thus cultivated, the precision and logic of modern science and technology holds out a strong attraction. Technology has been a passion since childhood, when the adolescent Dalai Lama took apart watches, film projectors, and Tibet's three cars. He's an expert tinkerer and enjoys fixing mechanical things. There is a scientific research, very important. Since the general Buddhist side, our idea or attitude is, is we must accept reason or the uh, the fact. Uh, it is a certain thing which actually we believe, but that not proved by fact or something which is contrary. Then we must uh, accept the fact rather than the uh, certain thing which is described in, the, uh, in this uh, scripture. So now, for example, the Buddha himself is very clearly mentioned that you must accept certain thing through your own investigation. It is your own, how to say, using logic and reason, not the art of devote or faith. People are drawn so to the Dalai Lama's infectious personality, no his philosophy of optimism of and hope and a life of frequent personal trials as a quality of surrender. Like there is no grasping or clinging to the fruits of his actions, and yet there is a vitality to his every gesture. In order to uh, practice is better, in, you see, in particular that day, uh, with, uh, so it is solely that motivation. I think <laughs> one or two. <laughs> Let's say good, maybe all right. I think. <laughs> so you see, the main main point is we have to look the you see result or the value. Basic Buddhist principle is relative. There is no absolute. Say, for example, killing is very bad. Buddhists say believe in non-violence. But now you see. Violence means now, here, you see, many different levels of violence and non-violence. Which is very bad motivation uh, to uh, show very kindness, you see, attitude. The ultimate goal or aim is uh, try to lead wrong way and through very kind attitude. Now that's worst kind of violence, isn't it? In awarding the Nobel Prize to a political and spiritual leader, the Nobel Committee identified three elements in his peace philosophy. A commitment to nonviolence, to secure fundamental human rights for all people, and to focus attention on the natural environment. The Nobel Committee pointed out that the Dalai Lama combined the ancient wisdom of the East with a contemporary pragmatism. He has urged the cultivation of a harmony within man that can manifest itself in his relations with his fellow man and with nature. The Dalai Lama's appeal as someone who embodies the ideal of a spiritual quest makes him a frequent and welcome guest at congregations of different faiths around the world.
because there are so many different what are all mental disposition in human human brain so one religion may not suitable for everyone now that's the consensus one thing we should keep in our mind is you see closer relation uh this is closer understand then it it will develop mutual respect now i would like to give you just a token present as a memory and here is a specially bound volume of a translation of the life of st benedict by st gregory which was translated by one of our monks some years ago it's quite simple english <laughs> the Tibetan flag remains the symbol of a free Tibet in the future. The battle between Marxist materialism and Buddhist spiritualism, between the power of the gun and the power of nonviolence and compassion now soars. The most serious threat to the future of Tibet, the freedom of its people and the preservation of its culture, is the massive orchestrated transfer of the Chinese Han population into Tibet, rapidly reducing the Tibetans to a minority in their own country. steadfastly advocates nonviolence for his people and reaches out to a world increasingly responsive to his message of peace for all of us.